But we begin with the big story and the lacrosse double pulled off this past weekend by the men's and women's teams at Maryland. The women's team on Sunday knocking off homestanding Rutgers 18 to 8. Game was tied at seven at the half. Terps go on an 11-1 run in the second half. Aurora accordingly, your tournament most valuable player with nine points in the win. Maryland, the number two overall seed in the NCAA tournament. We'll get to that in just a bit. The Maryland men are the number one seed in the NCAA tournament. That's what happens when you run the table unbeaten and the first ever home team to claim the tournament title 17-7 over Rutgers on Saturday night. Logan Wisnowskis, the most valuable player, he and Anthony DeMeo, both with four goals in the championship night win over Rutgers. And so there you have it in 24 hours. Two chips. Congrats to both the Maryland women and men. Yes, this year you can truly say that College Park is the lax capital of the world. Anthony DeMeo joins us from College Park. Anthony, let's start with a pretty simple question. What has this ride been like, the unbeaten season in your fifth and final go-round as a Terp? Uh, it's been awesome. Uh, all the guys have been great. Um, that you couldn't ask for uh, a better start to the season. Uh, obviously, the job's not finished, and we got to keep plugging away here. But uh, it's been great, and I'm uh, obviously super happy with my decision to come back. Yeah, and your reason to come to Maryland in the very first place, in your own words, was to win a national championship. Now, you were a redshirt freshman on that 2017 team that won it all. How much do those memories kind of motivate you this year? Uh, I mean, there's just nothing better, just not, not a better feeling out there in the world uh, than winning a national championship and hoisting that trophy. And part of the reason why in my decision to come back is to help those guys, uh, help some of these guys that are on the team now f have that same feeling. And uh, that's something that I'll just never forget. So I just want to make sure and hope for the best that we can get that done this year. Uh, you've had an outstanding season, had a terrific tournament, four goals in the final. And as I watched you through the course of the year, a lot of times you seem to save your best for when the team needs it most. Some athletes will call that the clutch gene. Do you get more calm as the stakes kind of get a little bit higher? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I just think over the years that with all the all the big games and all the uh, just all the times that we've been in tough situations, I think obviously if you went back and said freshman year, I definitely wasn't that way. And I think just the more experience you get is uh, where that comes from. And I think that in those moments, uh, I kind of just I settle down, just take deep breaths and I try to bring the others along with me. Anthony, I know you guys would never say this inside your own locker room, but outside the locker room, there are those who are saying this Maryland team is unbeatable. And they're saying that because you won every Big Ten game this year. You did it by an average of about nine goals per game. How much pressure do you guys put on yourselves to be as close to perfect as possible? Uh, I mean, I think it starts with our approach day in and day out. Uh, just the, with the coach's mindset and then everyone on our team, just focusing on us getting better each day, not really worried about what other teams are doing. Um, I'm sure there's going to be teams out there that throw different stuff at us. And, I mean, as long as we stay true to ourselves and do what we have to do and stick together, I think that we'll be good. Um, I think that's the biggest attribute uh, to this team is the fact that we, we do stick together through thick and thin and uh, we'll be ready for whatever throwing at us obviously that starts at the front of the room with head coach John Tillman I find it interesting because I know he's a, a fairly calm guy at least when we see him not inside the locker room perhaps but when we get to see him he's a humble guy I remember interviewing him when Maryland first joined the league and he told me how much he kind of hated doing the media stuff because he wanted all the attention on his players how accurate is that from a player's perspective regarding your head coach's personality yeah, I mean, that's the most accurate thing uh, about Coach. Um, all he does is care about the players, uh, not even on the field, but off the field. He wants to set us up for what's next after lacrosse, uh, whether that's getting a job or checking in on our families and all that stuff. It's so much more than just lacrosse to him, and that's what makes him such a good coach and why everyone on our team respects him so much is because he he, he is a great coach and he knows a lot on the field, but it's this, the stuff that he teaches us off the field, and he definitely he just has that mindset and he instills all of that in us and you see that with a lot of our third fourth fifth year guys that have seen that and kind of had adopted that method and if it wasn't for him we wouldn't have that same mindset speaking of guys who try to avoid the media sometimes I would say the same thing about Logan Wisnowski who appears to be a reluctant superstar 
It, it sounds like he prefers, even when he's named the MVP of the tournament, he would prefer a different guy to be interviewed. Uh, what's he like as a teammate, and what's he like as a guy off the field? Uh, I mean, he's definitely obviously really focused on the goal uh, after last year. I mean, that definitely that takes you back a little bit and wants to make you work that much harder, and I think that he shows that each and every day. Um, I would say he's definitely he's a very quiet leader. Uh, he does by example. Um, you don't always see him. He's not the guy hooting and hollering before the games and all that, but you just know, we know what we're going to get from him. He's focused, and he's definitely very selfless in what he, what he does and how he cares about his teammates. Uh, I think that that just shows who this group is we have all of our guys are like that and I think that that's kind of what makes us who we are but Logan definitely it starts with him from the top well let's talk about the other Logan your goaltender Logan McNaney maybe doesn't get the attention of some of the other goalies in the nation but he's 31 and one in his career and there was a goal in the second half against Rutgers that capped off an 8-1 run he stopped Ronan Jacoby and quickly with that kind of transition offense. The outlet ended up in Logan Wisnowskis' basket. He found Eric Molliver, boom. And Logan Wisnowskis points down to McNaney as almost to say, that goal's for you. How much did that one specific play kind of encapsulate his value? I mean, anytime we can get transition, uh, John Gepper, Roman Puglisi, uh, Jake Higgins, all those guys do a great job getting it out in transition and getting it to our offense. And that's just th those goals are some goals just mean more than others. And when those guys are running and gunning down the field, that definitely helps us a lot. And it starts with Logan making saves. Logan's one of the most calm people I know uh, before the games, just all the time uh, throughout his day, everything that he does, he's just he's focused on the task at hand, but he does it. He's so laid back, and I think that's what makes him uh, so good. Um, he 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 doesn't he doesn't let one goal. He lets something in. He just makes the next play. Uh, he lets it go, and that's why he's so good. Now I know that you are originally a Boston guy, but you played high school lacrosse out on the West Coast, and that's where your family was when you started at Maryland. I understand they were flying coast to coast, going everywhere to, to watch you play, but now they've relocated closer to College Park. How much does that mean to you to have them nearby? Uh, I mean, it definitely, it helps my whole family. Uh, I have, I have th four little sisters as well. Two are still in middle school. And then uh, there's two. One plays at uh, Hood College and the other one plays at UMBC. So the fact that they get to make it to all the games uh, and they're always around uh, supporting us definitely helps. Um, I know that they, if they were still in California, they would still make the trip. But um, it definitely makes it easier on them and makes us obviously have a nice place to go home if we need on the weekends that's very close to all of us. So it's definitely nice. All right, Anthony, let's get you out of here on this. The goal is to win the rest of them and hoist the national championship on Memorial Day weekend. You've seen the bracket. What are your thoughts? What's the team's approach as you get ready for the tournament that truly matters more than any other? Uh, I think just on it, it's a new season. Um, I think anything that's happened in the past so far, we just have to let go. Um, I think we, we've obviously had a lot of success, but I mean, we just got to go in with the mindset that the job's not finished and it's gonna, we still have to get better, focus on us uh, each and every day, um, especially in the next couple weeks. Uh, gonna have to recover. We played two games in three days already, so that's a good uh, test uh, to where we would have to get to, but that's, that's gonna come more down the stretch and we just have to focus on recovery, um, getting better, little things. There's obviously still things that we have to do a lot better, so just focusing on that. Um, I know the coaches will get our uh, coaches and older guys will get us get our heads in the right position and just going forward focus on us uh, whatever's thrown at us just be ready to go Maryland midfielder Anthony DeMeo and the Terps focused on the 2022 national title Anthony we truly appreciate the time congrats on the Big Ten title and of course best of luck in the NCAAs the Big Ten softball tournament bracket is set you see the first round matchups on Wednesday and then on Thursday the top four seeds receive a first round by they'll advance into the quarterfinals those top four seeds in order Northwestern Nebraska Illinois and Michigan and for much more on the Big Ten tournament welcome in softball analyst Sammy Netling a Northwestern clinched the regular season title and that one seed on Friday night so they had the whole weekend to enjoy it watch the rest of the league watch the film how much separation is there really between the cats at the top and the rest of the contenders I think that gap is really as big as Northwestern wants to make it right now, right? I, I, I truly believe they're a World Series caliber team, but we saw some weaknesses this weekend in Minneapolis, right? And I think the biggest question mark is, is when their ace, when their workhorse, Danielle Williams, 
falters if she does it all because we have not seen it really outside of this Minnesota series. Can they can they uh, complement her offensively and defensively? And I, I think that's where they, they they didn't really show up for for their pitcher on on Friday and Saturday. Granted, they took a big step in the in the right direction on Sunday. But if they really want to do what they've set out to do this year, far beyond anything at the conference level, I think again that kind of fate is is in their hands in terms of how things play play out this weekend in in East Lansing. All right. So which team or teams below Northwestern in terms of state? It's the Gophers, who, who they just saw this, this past weekend, a team that is always highly competitive in the, in the Big Ten tournament. I think even, you know, a Penn State or Ohio State with, with who they have in, in their bullpen and, and even some of their, their offensive firepower. But I really think the, the other two teams in the conversation are Nebraska and Michigan. Again, solely because of, of the depth that they have in their bullpen, the, the bats that they have in their lineup, and two teams that have gone through that rough patch in their season and are now really kind of peaking at just the right time going into postseason. And with the four seed that Michigan earned by virtue of Maryland getting swept on the final day and the Wolverines sweeping the series from Wisconsin, they would potentially face the top seed Northwestern in the semifinals in a one versus four. We know Nebraska and Northwestern are almost locks for the NCAA tournament. Regardless of what happens this week, who else is in? I think looking at the RPI, and then it was just updated today after this weekend's games, I think Nebraska is a lock. I think N Northwestern is a lock. I think Michigan and Ohio State. All of those teams are in the top 30 of the RPI. And, and again, credit to Ohio State and to Michigan going at Maryland for Ohio State and going into Madison and, and taking the sweeps this weekend. Huge momentum shift, a huge statement to the selection committee that those two teams also deserve to be in that kind of automatic uh, conversation. All right, so which teams need this week? Which teams are on the bubble but with a good week could maybe get on the right side of the bubble if they don't win the auto bid? Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Wisconsin, especially because they, they've looking at, you know, the selection committee does look at your, your uh your past 12 games okay. leading up in, into, into NCAAs, and Wisconsin has lost the, the past six games. So I think this tournament is huge for them. They, they dropped an RPI down to 35. But Minnesota, on the flip side of that conversation, went to from 42 to 35 with a strong performance against the Northwestern Wildcats. So I think those two, again, along with Illinois, are really on the bubble in terms of RPI and, and getting that at-large bid for NCAAs. As you try to project forward moving Wednesday through the entire weekend in East Lansing. What's the most intriguing potential matchup that we could see this week? Yeah, I think there's a handful just because we have so much great pitching right now in the conference. I think, you know, a Penn State, Nebraska second round with, with a Bailey partial against a high-powered Husker offense. Similarly, with, with an Illinois with Sickles and McQueen and Wiles against a high-powered Buckeye offense. But I'm really looking forward to the Northwestern matchups. Again, one to see, are they going to really turn it around and be the team that we know they can be against potentially a rematch against a Minnesota or a Wisconsin team that they've never seen, against potentially a rematch against a Michigan team that is very different than the team they saw earlier in this year but the matchup that I, that I am crossing my fingers that we that we get in our championship is Nebraska versus Northwestern didn't get to see that during the regular season which players because this is the time of the year where a player can really make a make a name for herself which player or players do you think could maybe steal a game or two this weekend and make an ultimate difference I really think it's going to be a, a combination of the pitchers that we have in our conference. Bailey Partial for Penn State, Lexi Hanley for, for the Buckeyes, a Maddie Schwartz, can she turn it around for the Badgers? And then ultimately, I, I really think this, this tournament is, is going to go by the way of, of which Danielle Williams do we see. She is my pick for, for potentially pitcher of the year this year. I think she's one of the best nationally. And again, for, for Northwestern to do what they need to do this week in East Lansing to, to prove to the selection committee that – they're not just a top 16 team, but they are a top eight team. We're going to need a big week out of Danielle Williams. Yeah, obviously, Illinois with Sickles and McQueen is a great one-two punch. You mentioned Michigan. You always have Starocco and Bobby in for Carol Hutchins to go to. So, so much good pitching in this league, but so many dangerous lineups, one to nine. We're about to get the regular season awards for softball. Let's predict some of those. Who do you anticipate being the coach of the year? Yeah, I, I think two uh, very different programs and very different coaches have the potential just because just incredible stories this year. Obviously, you have Kate Drohan, best start in program history, 
reclaiming the Big Ten title, first outright title since 2006, and again, just just putting together a team that you, you feel is really poised to potentially make an Oklahoma City run. But then, arguably, and, and it, just a, a more like heartfelt story for, for the underdog, Penn State and, and Coach Clarissa Crowell. I mean, what a turnaround they've had this year. Seven total wins in 2021, and, and they've turned it around 30-plus wins now in 2022. They have the, the single greatest turnaround in terms of winning percentage this year in all of Division I softball. So just two incredible stories, incredible programs, really, really elevating just uh, the, the organizations that they have. And obviously, Ronda Ravel probably in that conversation as well. Huskers won 18 straight at one point this season. A lot of good youngsters in the league this year. Who is the leading candidate or candidates for freshman of the year? There, there was a lot for sure. I, I think you know a Brianna Copeland from from Indiana doing it on both sides of of the plate, you know, offensively and in the circle. I, I think an Ava Breadwell, a, a, you know, a, a freshman that stood out for the Huskers and made an immediate impact on their high-powered offense. But my pick is is really Lauren Wiles from from the Illini. Uh, really just stepped in to be a true you know three uh, counterpart to Sickles and McQueen and, and helped elevate that pitching staff even more. And, and again, contributed to the the single season program record for strikeouts this year just a, a testament to to her and and again the, the rest of the the freshmen in the conversation all right a lot of pitching conversation because there's a lot of great pitchers in this league at the end of the day how much separates danielle williams from the rest of the league is she a clear winner of pitcher of the year I think the only thing that made this not a, a clear decision was the weekend that she had but but i i think it's the the body of work that she put together before this weekend in Minnesota to me still puts her levels of, above the rest of the crowd and and that's that's so impressive to say again with the the aces that we have in the circle in our conference you said it's Tarocco and Bobian and, and Hanley and, and and Sickles and Bailey Partial just so many big names we had six pitchers with 20 plus wins this year but you have Danielle Williams at the top fourth nationally in wins leading the country in saves and just in my opinion the the the, the linchpin for this Wildcat team in terms of the, the trajectory that we've seen them head on this year. Uh, and finally, predicting player of the year. It's not easy, but there are a few players who have separated themselves. Obviously, Rachel Lewis had in the all-time Northwestern home run record. Billy Andrews had a phenomenal... Other candidates as well. Who's the likely player of the year? Yeah, I, I I do think it's Rachel Lewis. I, I think just in terms of, of the rel, well-roundedness that she has from the offensive side of the ball, you said it. Billy Andrews, just incredible this year. Christina Burkhart, Kaylee Conway, again, another conference of, of just so many great offensive threats. Rachel Becker for Purdue hit over 500 in conference this year. But then you have a Rachel Lewis who, again, I, I think she she's just the, the most well-rounded across those offensive categories. She's the only player in Big Ten history to have 60-plus home runs and 100 stolen bases in her career, just really elevating herself into elite company in terms of the versatility that she has in, in her skill set. That's great stat, by the way. Get some rest. Going to need you this week. Big Ten tournament starts on Wednesday in East Lansing. Good stuff, as always, getting you ready for that event from Sammy Netling. Three teams, all with Terrapin logos, have won both the men's and women's lacrosse tournament titles in the same season. Maryland did it back-to-back -back in 16 and 17. And, of course, the Terps pulled it off again this past weekend with the men beating Rutgers on Saturday night, the women taking care of business against Rutgers on Sunday. Your Big Ten Tournament MVP, Aurora, accordingly, 16 points over two games and nine points in the championship game as the Terps outscore Rutgers 11-1 to in the second half to clinch that all-important championship trophy. It is time now for today's big interview. Aurora accordingly, Maryland attacker and the MVP of this weekend's Big Ten Tournament, joining us from College Park. Aurora, I want to go back to that championship game against Rutgers because they lead for a large portion of the first half. You're tied at halftime, and then you guys just blow it open after the break. So what changed in the second half? Yeah, I think we came out just a little hesitant. Um, I think we maybe the nerves got to us. It was a really big game um, and a big game for a lot of us for the first time. So um, I think we just had to, you know, calm our nerves, just play Maryland lacrosse, and ultimately that's what got us on top at the end of the day. 
And playing Maryland lacrosse, at least this year, means playing inside an offense that has been so prolific and so dangerous. What makes this offense tick? What is it at its best? Yeah, we just have so much depth, um, and I think there's just so much trust and love within um, the group. Um, you know, when one person gets hot one game, you know, you're going to see someone else step up the next game, and I think that's what's so special and makes us so hard to defend. And it's not just about the offense, obviously, at every level. You had three unanimous first-team All-Big Ten selections, only team to do that. You had Abby Bosco on the backside, of course, the outstanding netminder, Emily Sterling. What's it like as an attack player to know that you have such outstanding teammates on the back end as well. Yeah, for sure. Like they say, you know, offense wins games, defense wins championships. Our defensive unit is amazing, incredible. I'm happy that I don't have to play against them anymore because, <laughs> um, you know, they just talk so well with each other, communicate well. Um, and, you know, they have each other's backs at the end of the day. And I think that, you know, they play as a full unit, very unselfish. And we're just really lucky, you know, to have them on our, our back end. So the three of you, Yourself, Abby, and Emily are the first team unanimous selections, but obviously to do what you guys have done this year, it takes an entire team. Which players on your team don't get the recognition that maybe they deserve based on what they've been doing? I think Eloise Clevenger is someone that has stepped up. You know, she's a sophomore. Didn't see too much time last year, but isn't playing like, you know, a sophomore out on the field. Um, I think she's great field uh, vision um, and she's just very confident and you know I love playing with her you know we combine a lot um, on the offensive end together um, and I've honestly learned a lot from her so I think we just are really lucky just to see someone that has so much confidence at such a young age she's she's grown tremendously throughout this this season and you know she's going to keep growing and, and keep improving you know as she gets older and especially through May we're gonna you know look to her for um, a lot at the back. I want to go back to something that you said about being happy you don't have to play against players like Abby and Emily, and that, of course, is because you did when you were at Johns Hopkins, where you played during your undergrad career. How was that transition for you? Was it weird at the start? How long did it take to kind of feel like it was normalcy to be playing with so many players that you had played against for three or four years? Yeah, it didn't feel weird at all, you know, coming in right away. I think the team is so welcoming, um, and I just felt like I had been here the past four years right when I got here. Um, Kathy's built such an amazing culture, just so much genuine love and trust um, within this group. Um, so obviously it was a little weird, though, playing against my old teammates, but, you know, it was really fun. Me and my old roommate, Jeannie Kakris, were um, marked up with each other. So, you know, got to chat a little bit and catch up on the field. But, um, you know, Maryland has just been, you know, incredible. I couldn't ask for a better um, place and a better team to spend, you know, my last year of um, lacrosse eligibility. Okay, so you stole part of the question I was just about to ask, and I know it was probably a little <laughs> strange playing against a lot of those same players the first time that you played Hopkins during the regular season. Did it seem more normal when you played them in the tournament or just as weird? Um, I think it's a little bit more normal in the tournament. Obviously, going back to Hopkins, you know, that was bittersweet for me. Um, just, you know, being back on Homewood Field for another game. Um, but luckily, that's where the national championship is this year. So, you know, looking forward to coming back to, I guess, a place that, you know, felt like home. But um, it was nice being at Rutgers, you know, more of our fans in the stands, too. So um, just a cool experience overall. Now, they make the NCAA tournament as well as one of the last at-large teams to get in. And, of course, if they were to win their first game, they would play you guys in round number two. I'm sure you're happy to see Coach Tucker get to extend her career into the NCAAs, but is that something that you really want to have the potential of playing them in the NCAAs and possibly ending her coaching career? You know, I don't want to think about it that way. Um, I think that they have done enough, though, to earn that, that spot. Um, and I was honestly expecting them to come back to us because I did believe that we would be a two seed. Um, so it's exciting. We get the bye on Friday, so I get to watch them finally. I haven't been able to watch a lot of their games this year just because, you know, I've been playing um, in my games, but um, I'm excited to cheer them on. You know, if we get to play them again, you know, that's going to be fun. Um, you know, I love Coach Tucker. She's, you know, an amazing mentor um, and leader and was a big part of my life. And same goes for all the girls on that team. So, you know, it's, it's exciting just to, you know, have another chance to share the field with them again. Now, you're Canadian, and most people don't know that for a very long time, it was lacrosse, 
Not hockey, that was considered the national sport of Canada. It didn't change until they went to a summer official and winter official sport in 94. So how big is lacrosse in Ontario, specifically in Oakville, where you're from? Yeah, it's definitely growing. When I first picked up a stick, I was playing indoor, so I was playing box lacrosse. There wasn't um, any girls' field league in my town, so um, my mom actually helped start the, the field league in my, in my town growing up. So I picked up a field stick when I was in fifth or sixth grade, um, and I you know, continued playing it. I loved it a lot more than box. Obviously, playing with the boys wasn't too much fun, but um, yeah, it's definitely growing, and I think um, you'll see a lot of more, a lot more Canadians and then NCAA, especially wearing the number 45, who went to the Hill Academy with um, me or graduated before or after. So um, it's really exciting just to see all the Canadian representation in the NCAA. Obviously, there's more than just geographic separation between Ontario and uh, Quebecois neighbors. Uh, some in Quebec really don't want to speak English. Some in Ontario really don't want to try to speak French. How's your French? I actually took French at Hopkins all the way up to um, fluency, but it was online, so um, I, can't, I can't say that I'm, I'm fluent in it, but um, I can try to hold a conversation as best as I can. Well, well you can try anything you want because I don't know a single <laughs> word, so you'd be totally fine with me. All right, let's finish with this. You mentioned how your mom helped you start your lacrosse career. Your dad played for Team Canada, played and coached in the NLL. I know your mom played, what was the Canadian equivalent of women's college basketball? So overall, what was their influence on your athletic career? Yeah, no, for sure. I grew up in a very competitive household. I have three younger siblings too that all play lacrosse and a brother that actually plays um, college lacrosse too. He's a sophomore down at a D2 school in South Carolina. So um, a lot of, you know, fighting and the <laughs> slam doors, laughs, tears, everything. Everything was a competition growing up. Um, and they just kind of, you know, I guess, festered that, fostered that um, competitive edge in me just from a young age. All right, so there were fights growing up, but now everybody is rooting for you as you and the Terps get into the NCAA tournament and look to finish off what's been an outstanding season with the national title. MVP of this weekend's Big Ten tournament, Aurora Cordingly of Maryland. Aurora, great to catch up. We appreciate the time. Best of luck in the tournament. Thank you so much. Iowa pitching staff made some history this weekend, eclipsing the 500 strikeout mark for the first time in school history. Previous mark had been 499 set four years ago. It is the Lunderton effect, according to the baseball Twitter handle. That is referencing Robin Lund, the pitching coach at Iowa. Overall, what a year it's been for Hawkeye hurlers. They are among the top three in the league in all the categories that you see on your screen. Most importantly, first in ERA, earned runs allowed, opponent batting average, and of course, strikeouts now at 5.07. And one of the men behind those outstanding numbers joins us now, Iowa pitching coach Robin Lund. Uh, Robin, your group is among the Big Ten's best in multiple categories. You just set the single-season Iowa record for strikeouts over the weekend. What's your overall philosophy when it comes to managing different arms on the staff? Well, it, so you, you know my background. I, I spent a lot of time as, as, a, as a university professor, so... I, I'm a self-proclaimed scientist who just happens to pitch co or uh, coach pitchers. So I, we, we just use a lot of science, a lot of technology. I mean, we're not using anything different than, than a lot of people are using. Um, but it's a, it's a, there's a lot of different pieces to it. And it's kind of hard to determine what are those, which, which one of those pieces is really responsible for, for our guys' success, you know, so strength and conditioning plays a role. Obviously you've got stuff you're doing to try to build velocity, um, obviously pitch design, um, and then optimization, you know, making sure we're using their, their arsenal in the, in the best possible way. Well, one guy that's certainly using his arsenal in the best possible way as of late is Adam Mazur. Last four starts, he's gone at least eight in each, won a complete game. I think he's allowed a total of four runs in those starts. So what is Adam doing so well right now? Well, he he's pounding the strike zone. Um, I, my, I, just looking at the numbers, I don't have them right in front of me right now. But my guess is he's anywhere between sixty-seven to seventy-three um, percent strikes. And so, um, basically, it, one of two things is happening: he's overwhelming hitters with strikes, and there's either going to be a lot of early contact, which has kind of happened uh, the last few outings, where maybe the punch outs were down. I think he's striking out five or six uh, in those outings. Or, you know, uh, they're going to take more aggressive swings and, and he's going to put guys away. But ultimately, you're right. Like the last four starts, it's been, you know, just incredibly efficient. I think he was at 90 pitches in the ninth inning 
uh, this last start. Yeah, when we discussed the possibility of him coming out in the ninth or in that complete game, he said there was no chance, not with the pitch count that I had. Uh, who yeah. else on this staff right now, Robin, has been impressing you as of late? Well, you know, to, to break that strikeout record um, with nine games left, you need an entire stable of ponies, right? That can that can get punch outs. It can't just be your starters. You need every guy on the staff um, needs to be able capable of getting strikeouts. But um, obviously, the one that uh, guys like to talk about is Brody Brecht. Um, you know, he lights up the radar screen or the uh, the radar gun pretty regularly. You know, like throwing a hundred miles an hour. Um, you got Connor Schultz up there right now, who's uh, got a five picks five pitch mix. So he's not going to throw as hard as some of the other guys, but um, but he's got a five pitch mix and he he strikes guys out. You got you just showed. Um, uh, Dylan Nedved, um, just a really unique arm slot, you know, a lot of crossfire from that, from that slot with a plus slider and a plus change. And, uh, so there's a, you know, I can talk about really all our guys, like all our guys are punching guys out. So, you know, that's what you need to break that kind of record. Not just a couple of guys that can do it. Well, Robin, you mentioned at the top of the interview that you have a unique background, that you were a professor for a long time, that you stepped away from baseball, not all the way away, but at least from the playing and coaching perspective. And you met Rick Heller back in the early 2000s at a different school. You stay in touch the entire time. You help him with the program there. And then nearly two decades later, you rejoin his staff. I mean, this story seems like it's almost too hard to believe. Yeah, I, I, I'm just so grateful and so appreciative um, to have gotten an opportunity to get back into coaching. I, I told Chad this didn't make the story, but there's about only two guys in the country that would have that would have taken a chance on a guy who'd been out of the game like I'd been for almost two decades. And that was Rick Heller. And then the other one would, would be Dan Hefner. Um, so just to get the opportunity, it just felt like, you know, what a blessing. And I just felt like uh and, and, you know, I want to work, I work hard anyway, but when you get a second shot, I just assumed I would never coach again at this level. And so to get a second shot has just been, has been incredible. Well, you started talking a little bit about the physiology and how you apply some of what you used as a professor to pitching. How much does that help you? Does that give you a unique perspective that maybe other pitching coaches simply don't have? Yeah. And so it's not even, it's, it's that. And then I, I've never, I was never a pitching coach. Like my first pitching coaching position was this one. And I, you know, I, I had some anxiety. I was nervous about it. Um, mainly I was really worried about how the guys were going to um, take the news that a guy who had never been a pitching coach was going to be their pitching coach. And I would, so I was worried about that and they were, they were great. They welcomed me with open arms and, and, and have been awesome um, every year. But, you know, I've talked to, I have some friends that have been pitching coaches for a long time and they tell me they're just a little bit jealous that, you know, that, the fact that I'm not necessarily hamstrung with a lot of um, kind of like different ways of doing things. Right. Like we, there's just certain things that we do that are these sacred cows that um, probably don't make sense. And I'm not really hampered by any of that stuff. So I'm coming in with a really, with a, with a clean slate and a, uh, you know, just a fresh approach to pitching maybe that's, that's going to be unique, but it's grounded in it's grounded in science analytics and, and technology. Now, if that were the most interesting story of your life, that would be interesting enough, but in my mind, it's really not because you grow up in a small northern Canadian town where baseball basically ends after eighth grade. So to continue your baseball career at the age of 14, your parents take you to Idaho where you live with multiple families that you had never met before. So what was that experience like? How did it shape, shape you as a person? Well, I just was I, I remember, you know, distinctly my parents dropping me off and this is a 14 year old. I was so excited. It was such an exciting thing to be, you know, obviously in a different country, but the town that I grew up in was, is about Peace River, Alberta is about 6,000 people. And so I was just elated. And when my mom and dad left, you know, they, they did a nice job of, of, of not being emotional and they dropped me off. But you know, the report that I got from them was they drove down the street and cried in the car for about an hour before they could compose themselves to leave. Cause I was an only child as well. And so it was about an 18 hour drive. I was 18 hours away from them in a different country. So obviously um, I don't feel like it, it didn't feel like it was difficult or I was doing anything special. I just wanted to play baseball so badly that um, I was willing to do anything. So, um, but again, you talk about being appreciative of, of things. I, there's not a lot of parents that would have, that would have done that, that would have drove their, only child as a 14 year old all the way to the country. So, um, you know, I can never thank them enough. Um, my, my parents, I can never thank them enough um, for that. So just an absolutely phenomenal story. I'm not sure if they're going to bring back that commercial campaign about the most interesting man in the world. But if they do, Robin, and if they're looking for an actor, do you mind if I send your name along? 
Yeah, 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 sure. It's been a while since I've had drama class, so, but yeah, sure, go ahead. Iowa baseball pitching coach Robin Lund on Hawkeye pitching and much, much more. Robin, great to get to know you a little bit. Truly appreciate your time on the show today. Best of luck to you and the staff done the rest of the way and, of course, throughout the Big Ten baseball tournament. The NCAA released its tournament brackets for both men's and women's lacrosse on Sunday night. Five women's teams making the draw, led by two among the top four seeds. Maryland, the number two seed, could potentially play Johns Hopkins in a second-round matchup on Sunday. Northwestern opens against Central Michigan. Rutgers faces St. Joe's. Michigan takes on Notre Dame, and Hopkins does play that first-round game against Duke. On the men's side, no surprise, Maryland, a no-question number one overall seed. They will play the winner of the Vermont-Manhattan game on Friday. The Maryland game against that winner will be played on Sunday at noon Eastern. Rutgers deals with a pesky Harvard team as the Scarlet Knights get the number six seed. And Ohio State does make the field as an at-large. They will play against number seven overall seed, Cornell. And for much more on these brackets, we welcome in Big Ten Network lacrosse analyst Mark Dixon. Mark, listen, there was no question Maryland was going to be number one in the men's bracket. They've been number one in the nation all year long. And you asked the question during a great call with Joe Beninati in Saturday's championship game, can anyone out there slow down this Maryland team? So I'll ask you the same question you asked. How big a favorite are they? And is there any team that is built in a way to slow down the Terps? I think entering the tournament, Rick, Maryland is, gosh, they got to go off maybe a two to one favorite to win the national championship based on their body of work in the regular season and then the Big Ten tournament. But if you're the Maryland Terrapins, you're not looking past anyone. Obviously, they'll they'll take on the winner of the play in game uh, on Sunday and potentially in the second round, you're looking at maybe a rematch of last year's national championship game and a replay of what we saw in late March at Audi Field in D.C. versus the University of Virginia. And that was a banged up Virginia team, although Maryland smoked them by, by 11 goals. Do I see Virginia as a threat to Maryland? I do. Do I still think the Terrapins can beat the Cavaliers? Absolutely no question. I think at this point it might be outside competition looking at Maryland. Maybe the Georgetown Hoyas could present them a battle. You need a great face-off man, and Georgetown has that. You need an outstanding goalie. The Hoyas have that as well. But they're on opposite sides of the bracket, so these guys are not going to meet till potentially the national championship game. But I think the biggest imminent, most imminent danger to the Maryland Terrapins could be the Virginia Cavaliers. But again, if Maryland plays anywhere near like they played back on March 23rd or anywhere near like they've played for the majority of the 2022 season, I think the Terps are a safe. Carson Wudnowskis and DeMeo had four goals in the championship game. You mentioned faceoff, goalie. Weirman's had a ridiculously good year. Logan McNaney, really underrated. They, no question, have it all. Rutgers gets in as a six seed. You said you thought they would be either a six or a seven before the selection show. That's exactly where they land. What do you make of the Scarlet Knights draw? Wow, this is the one that has the lacrosse world on fire uh, with the Harvard Crimson getting into the NCAA tournament with an 8-4 and four record, a RPI of 15. They do have quality wins over Brown and Princeton. They also beat Boston University, who's in the field. But this is the team that everyone's really questioning into the field. That being said, Rutgers is going to have their hands full. You know, this is a Harvard team that really doesn't know any better. They're incredibly young. And when you factor in, they didn't play in the 2021 season. They have a number of players that are freshmen, but they're really supposed to be sophomores. But it's still a very, very young team. And you look at Rutgers, maybe the most experienced team age-wise in the NCAA tournament. You talk about the transfers, Bartolo, Cameron, uh, Apgar on the defensive end, Ronan Jacoby. These are guys who have been there done that before in terms of NCAA competition, in terms of tournament competition. Then you throw in your Knobloch's and your uh, Gallagher's and Colin Curse between the pipes. This is a very sound Rutgers team that was once again really humbled by the University of Maryland. So an uneven weekend that saw Rutgers trailing at halftime to Ohio State. They came out like gangbusters in the second half to knock off the Buckeyes in the Big Ten semi. But again, came up short against their arch nemesis in the Big Ten, the University of Maryland. But I can tell you, this Rutgers team, their jersey pride is going to show out this coming weekend. They have a home game. 
You can bet that the alumni and the fan base are going to come out in full force and support this ball club. And you have that experience against a very inexperienced Harvard team. It's going to be a great game, but you have to like the, the Rutgers' chances uh, in the first round of the NCAAs. Yeah, the lacrosse world not really thrilled about that Harvard inclusion. Certainly in Durham, there is some disappointment about that and other places around the country. Ohio State, Mark, gets an at-large. What do you think that says about the national perception of both the Buckeye program and the Big Ten as a league? I think the respect is back. I know last year the narrative was established that the Big Ten was down, quote-unquote, just because the league played conference-only competition and they just basically beat the tar out of each other each and every week, twice. Uh, going through that gauntlet once is enough. But twice is, is some real attrition. So you're looking at an Ohio State team that has some great wins this season, especially out of conference. When you talk about knocking off Notre Dame, University of North Carolina, and that Harvard team, you, know, you mentioned Durham, North Carolina uh, being upset. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a riot in South Bend with the way that the, uh, the, the Irish faithful have reacted to the exclusion of their ball club from the NCAA tournament. But at the end of the day, I think wins matter. And when you take the RPI of 14 combined with the bulked up schedule that Nick Myers and the Buckeyes play, couple that with the quality wins over some of the teams that were in contention for an at-large berth, and that equals Ohio State going to the NCAA tournament. They'll take on a Cornell team that beat them back in early March, 14-11. It was a terrific game. It was back up at Ithaca. So this is familiar ground to the Ohio State Buckeye men's lacrosse team. They'll go back up uh, into upstate New York and try to pull off the upset against a very talented big red team. And I tell you what, Rick, uh, I, I think that uh, the Ohio Buckeye Nation is hoping they can win that game because if they do, they will be the host and the site for the quarterfinals the following weekend. All right, Mark, about 90 seconds left to discuss the women's tournament. Maryland, the overall number two, so impressive the last three weekends. But they're joined by Northwestern, Rutgers, Michigan, Johns Hopkins. I mean, the strength of this league right now with five teams, I think that just speaks volumes. Respect. It's total respect to the women of the Big Ten Lacrosse Conference. Maryland jumped uh, Boston College in the projected seedings, taking the number two seed, and the Eagles slipped the number three. Look at the strides that Rutgers has made. They gave Maryland all they could handle in the first half of that Big Ten championship game. And, oh, by the way, Northwestern is a seven-time national champion. And then you round it out with uh, with Michigan and Johns Hopkins. You know, Hannah Nielsen won national titles at Northwestern. Janine Tucker, her last go-round as the head coach of, of the Blue Jays. So it's great to see these Big Ten women's programs in the big dance. All right, Mark, about 30 seconds real quickly on Maryland. How impressed have you been the last three weekends? Super impressed. Uh, this is a team that was disappointed a year ago. They were runners up in the Big Ten and they made the NCAA tournament. That's considered a down year in College Park when you talk about all the national championships that Kathy Reese has won as a player and then won as a coach. But they're 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 solid. You know, Emmy uh, Bosco on the defensive end, Emily Sterling in the goal accordingly on attack, Griffin and Ahern in the midfield. This is a solid group that's been completely. Totally impressive, and they could certainly make a run to a national title. And solid analysis on the cross, as always, from Mark Dixon. Mark, we appreciate the time.